you get dressed for battle, spang and helm. This helmet is a pretty good deal for the beginning reenactor because not only is it tough, but it's also pretty affordable. It's only about a hundred bucks. And that's a pretty good price to pay to protect your head. Uh, it's constructed out of two halves of 14 gauge steel uh, that are then both welded and riveted together with the, the straps. Um, at the bottom, the bottom rim is also, uh, looks like 16 gauge, uh, but that's actually riveted and then welded around the base and ground. So it's essentially at the very bottom uh, for whatever the penetration of the weld is, and I suspect it's fairly deep, uh, is for all intents and purposes a solid piece of metal. Uh, the nasal on it is 14 gauge and fairly rigid. Uh, when I've been wearing this, it's actually taken quite a heavy blow to the nose and hasn't bent. Uh, it's it's a pretty pretty solid solid uh, piece of equipment. Uh, for comfort, uh, the straps could be a little more comfortable. They're just very square in, in cross section and do rub a little bit on your on your chin. Um, and the inside has that suspension harness. I'm not the biggest fan of the suspension harness, but this one is fairly comfortable. Uh, the only reason that I'm not a huge fan of it is that it doesn't really take the impact as well as uh, the padding does. But with this, it means that uh, you, you should be wearing an arming cap underneath anyway. My problem is no commercial helmet that I've ever found is actually big enough for my head to fit an arming cap underneath. Uh, hence why at the moment I'm in the process of building my own. Um, so right now I'm using the Torvik loner helmet, uh, and it's actually a fairly fairly decent helmet for what you want. Uh, the only there is one downside to it over something like a spectacle helmet uh, is that this actually offers a little bit more protection around your eyes um, because anything you know and it just has to be longer than this gap uh, swinging in. Well, we'll hit this before it hits your eyes. Uh, if it's smaller or it's hooked like the, the bottom of a beard of an axe, it still can get in. Uh, but that's a lot more rare than something um, coming in here. Uh, yeah, it protects a lot from any diagonal strikes coming in, both both upwards, uh, upwards diagonal across, or from above. Um, it does prevent a lot of damage. But things can slip past, uh, hence why I have the, the scar there. Uh, an axe kind of clipped past it, and that was it. Um, but I've, I know a few people that have been doing uh, Viking reenactment for over 10 years and haven't gotten injured yet, and they wear a Spangen helm with a smaller nasal than this. Um, so it's all up to... Uh, sort of the, the level of control that your opponent has and also knowing where to not put your head. So I actually think that this is a very good deal for the price. Uh, for the beginner who doesn't know exactly what their character is going to be, uh, it works for all ranges up to essentially Jarl status uh, where you'd want something a little more embellished. Um, and it also works, it works for Saxon, it works for, uh, for Norman. You can even go almost into the Norman period with this, uh, just to the point where they're transitioning from the Spangen helm to the one piece conical helm. This will sort of work for, uh, a lower class individual. Um, and then of course from there, Spangen helms for the Crusades, uh, evolved to have faceplates. And it was just the ease of construction of one of these compared to raising a conical helm in one single piece. Uh, so this will work for a large number of people and it'll protect your head fairly well. Uh, if you have a larger head, uh, I would either recommend uh, getting a custom made helmet or finding something a little bit larger. Um, these do come in small, medium, and large. This is the largest. It's I don't know the, the exact specifications, but I will link you to the Get Dressed for Battle page that has all the specs on it. Um, some of the specs on the thicknesses of steel I think are a little suspect. Um, they 
mentioned that it's three millimeters thick, uh, but even on my uh, my sheet gauge earlier, even the uh, the sections that are you know th uh, three layers of metal thick here where it's welded uh, aren't even three mil according to my gauge, uh, but that could just be a discrepancy. So uh, yeah, it's it's a a solidly built thing. So this helmet weighs about six pounds for the large version, um, and it has a fairly high center of gravity. So one recommendation I would make is that if you buy this helmet and you intend on using it a lot, you attach an aventail to the back of it. Adding the chainmail to the back will prevent the helmet from wobbling around in your head so much, uh, like it's prone to do, even with a chin strap tied up nice and tight. Uh, just because most of the mass of it is above your ears. Uh, and it can be kind of uncomfortable when you're fighting having your helmet shift to the side. Uh, part of that is not good because now it's blocking this eye. Uh, as well as it's not protecting this side of my head as well. Uh, the Aventail will just make sure that the helmet stays low and it, and it prevents it from wobbling as much because it is more weight pushing down on your head. Uh, but it's also more well distributed, so you won't feel the weight as much. Um, six pounds sitting up above your head like that is, is quite a lot. Um, so the Aventail makes a huge difference. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out about the difference between wearing a Spangen helm and uh, one of the, or a Spangen helmet with a nasal versus the Spectacle or German Boost style helmet. Um, there are some advantages to both, and, and one is that the German Boost will protect your, your face a little bit better, but you also, with that having the extra pieces here, you lose visibility around you, so you can really only see very well directly in front of you. Uh, if you tried to look down a little bit, you'd see the plates. If you tried to look to the sides a little bit, you'd see the plates. Uh, you could see past them, but there's blind spots. So you might not see a blow coming in from, you know, this kind of angle, where that's quite apparent to me wearing the Spangen helm, uh, or the nasal helm. Uh, so that's kind of a consideration. It's sort of a trade-off. You either uh, gain a little bit of, um, or, or with, with the Spangen helm, or the, the nasal helm, you either lose a little bit of, of uh, protection and gain a bit of visibility, or with the Yerman Boo or Spectacle Helm, you lose a little bit of visibility, but you gain the extra protection. So that's a consideration when choosing that. Um, as well as a few things I, sh I should mention. Uh, I wear this helmet with just this hood on because I can't fit my head in any other way. It always gets too tight. Um, and if you're going to be, be playing in a way that has uh, headshots. Uh, I would definitely recommend getting a bigger helmet if your head can't fit in there without an arming cap. The arming cap helps phenomenally with absorbing the blow in a way that the uh, this leather liner just can't. Um, but with the groups that I, I'm with, uh, generally headshots are discouraged, uh, strongly discouraged, um, even though we acknowledge that a shot a, a strike to the head is a very viable combat technique. We just don't want to uh, accidentally hurt someone beyond, you know, just some, beyond something that is fixable. Um, you know, if somebody breaks their neck, uh, chances are that's not going to be fixed particularly well. Uh, and, and things like broken fingers and the occasional cut do happen. But we try to avoid any injury as much as possible. Um, so. And, and with headshots, uh, injuries are just more likely to happen. Uh, concussions and uh, compressed spines and stuff. So that's that uh, for safety. Um, I, I would definitely recommend getting a bigger helmet if your head doesn't fit properly. Uh, you can get away with it if you're not in a group that has headshots. Um, but as you can see by some of the damage on the helm, um, headshots happen. Uh, and sometimes with considerable force. Um, some of the rivets on this helmet are sunk in because something hit them really hard. Uh, I know one on the forehead is sunk in uh, from this last pa this 
past weekend, uh, where in a uh, sax fighting demo, uh, me and a member of my group headbutted each other just a little too hard, and I managed to, to dent one of the rivets in a little bit, uh, which just wasn't very good, uh, especially since I wasn't wearing an army cap underneath. <laughs> uh, luckily, I have a thick skull. And another thing to note is the name Spangenhelm uh, is basically just an, a, talking about how it is a helmet made of plates and how this is four plates. Uh, I believe sometimes, probably later period, uh, it was just two halves that were had a, a central strip to connect them together. Uh, but before that, with the in the Vendel period, uh, with the Valsgard helmets, and uh, I think some of the ones that are Saxon uh, from England, uh, like the Coppergate helmet, um, were actually many plates stuck together. Um, so Spangen helms come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and some, like the Groningen helmet, which was found in the Netherlands, uh, was totally covered in spikes. Uh, I would actually love to get a, a reproduction of that or make one, uh, but sadly it's not safe for combat in my group. Yeah, too spiky. No, no hedgehog head for me. Uh, anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, please don't hesitate to like, comment, or and or subscribe. Thank you again.